Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the DIM 400 musculoskeletal section on radiology of idiopathic and metabolic conditions. I'm Dr. Leroux, and I'll be giving these lectures. So this is one of the more trickier sections, just because there are a lot of new names um, to remember. Some can be confused with each other, and also some new conditions um, that you may not have heard about before. So the lecture plan is broken down into congenital and developmental conditions, which is retained endochondral cartilage cores, metabolic, which is nutritional and renal secondary hyperparathyroidism and rickets, and miscellaneous condi conditions such as panosteitis, hypertrophic osteodystrophy, hypertrophic osteopathy, and craniomandibular osteopathy. So the first condition we'll be looking at is retained endochondral cartilage cores. So retained means that the cartilage has been left behind when it shouldn't have. Endochondral cartilage refers to cartilage that should have undergone endochondral um, ossification, which is responsible for the longitudinal growth of bones. And the core just refers to the shape um, and the location of the cartilage that has uh, remained behind. Another word for this is metaphyseal cartilage spike, which is very descriptive. It says exactly what it is. It is a cartilage um, piece that is in the shape of a spike and it's located in the metaphysis. So the um, pathophysiology is uncertain. It's not sure if, there's, if it's dietary, for example, excess calcium or just fast growth but it's thought that the bone growth exceeds the growth of the blood supply to the physis, resulting in an inability of chondrocytes to degenerate and calcify, therefore disrupting the normal progression of endochondral ossification. When the growth slows down again, the blood supply can catch up and the bone will ossify normally. This typically occurs in young, large or giant breed dogs and the Great Dane is overrepresented. If the condition starts when the dog is very young, signs of delayed growth of the distal ulnar plate can occur due to physical disturbances. This does not result, however, in premature closure, but rather just delayed growth. So on this slide, we'll look at the radiological um, findings in this condition. Often the changes are bilaterally symmetrical and the distal ulna is most commonly affected. This is because if you remember back to the previous lectures, the distal ulna contributes 85% of the longitudinal growth of the bone and thus is very active. A radiolucent cartilage core is seen within the ulna usually, so I'm demonstrating it here on the image, and it extends in a spike-like fashion or in a flame-like fashion into the metaphysis, and it can have a sclerotic rim, which is seen over here. So don't confuse this with the physis. The physis is this radiolucent line that's cone-shaped and projecting distally, whereas the cartilage core is this radiolucent area projecting into the metaphysis proximally. And as I've mentioned, it can cause delayed radial ulnar growth. Or di sorry, delayed distal ulnar growth. So the treatment in this case would be to attempt to slow down growth, and this is by correcting the diet and not giving any supplements. And if there is evidence of delayed um, growth of the ulna, then an ulna ostectomy can be considered. For example, in the images we've got here, there is bilateral retained endochondral cartilage cores in the ulna, and there is some evidence that the ulna is growing slower than the radius because the radius is starting to bow. So if um, we need to read up a little bit more about this, just go back to the notes on the premature closure of the distal ulna to see what the signs typically associated with that are. Now this, in this case, it won't be as severe, but milder changes, there might be a little bit of bowing seen um, and then treatment might be needed. Right, our second condition is nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism. And this typically occurs in young growing animals, and it is very common in the exotic species that are housed and housed incorrectly. Most common causes would be, for example, a kitten on a low calcium diet or puppies being fed pup containing excessive phosphate. So in any of these cases, an incorrect calcium to phosphate balance in the diet 
leads to a hypocalcemia, and this low calcium results in stimulation of parathyroid hormone and thus resorption of calcium from bone, resulting in osteopenia. The radiological abnormalities can resolve once the diet has been corrected. So the radiological signs are as follows. There can be diffuse osteopenia, mainly, mainly affecting the appendicular skeleton. If we look at the radiograph of this cat, there's very little difference in the opacity of the bone and the soft tissue. If you sit back and look at it, it almost looks like uh, a ghost-like. If we had to compare this to a normal animal where the skeleton would be much more mineralized and um, stand out a lot more with a lot more contrast. The bone cortices are thinned. There can be spinal curvature deformities and the term picture frame vertebra implies that the cortices of the vertebra look like a little box and the rest of the vertebral body is quite radiolucent. It's not so clear in the example here. Here I've just put in an example of a chameleon. Um, these species, exotic species, are often affected. Um, if one would look at an, the crest of a normal chameleon, it should be very radiopaque. Um, also, if we look at the hind limbs, there's very little difference in opacity between the bone and the soft tissue in the abdomen, for example. And this patient has got multiple abnormalities. It's got bowing of the radius and the ulna. There are multiple areas um, of fracture. I think there's a fracture down here. Um, probably a, a fracture of the femur head area over here. Here's another fracture that's um, malaligned. So that's very typical that we find um, in these exotic species. Here's an example of a feline. Um, the scapula here is um, bowed, and this is due to weight bearing on an abnormal bone. Also, the cortices are very thin, and the whole bone has got an osteopenic or radiolucent appearance. One can also get pelvic narrowing. For example, in this case, the pelvis is narrowed. Um, and one can also see folding or compression fractures, often in variable stages of healing. So some more acute and some more chronic occurring in the same patient. Uh, in this cat, there is a lot of um, mature bridging callus at the distal femurs, um, consistent with chronic fractures. And this slide just demonstrates how the radiological changes can resolve once the diet is corrected. So from that kitten at five months old to this one 12 months later, the fracture sites have remodeled, cortices and the bone are almost back to their normal width. There's a little bit of um, bowing and abnormal shape remnant, but the overall density or opacity of the bone is much more opaque than previously where it was osteopenic. So on the next slide, we look at renal secondary hyperparathyroidism. This is also referred to as renal rickets or rubber jaw. In immature animals, it's often as a result of renal dysplasia, resulting in chronic renal failure. Or in older animals, it could just be due to chronic renal disease of any um, underlying cause. And what happens in both of these cases is that there is phosphate retention by the kidney. The hyperphosphatemia results in a reciprocal hypocalcemia. And this hypocalcemia is the stimulus for parathyroid hormone release, which results in um, resorption of calcium from the bone. So the long bone changes are similar to that for nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism. But renal secondary hyperparathyroidism tends to be um, more localized to the skull. For example, here um, is a Labrador puppy with quite a swollen face. And this is because the calcium has been resorbed from the bone and replaced by fibrous tissue. Here's an example just of, a, um, of the rostral maxilla of the same puppy. You can see the swelling, and then there's also displacement of the canine tooth and also of the incisor. So I've said the skull changes are the most dramatic, and um, so one can say that 
renal secondary hyperparathyroidism has a selective osteopenia for the skull. In the skull bones, one will see a loss of the lamina dura. Now, the lamina dura is the thin little sclerotic bone margin that runs parallel to the, to the tooth roots, which depicts the alveolar bone forming the tooth socket. One can see floating teeth. For example, on this DV radiograph, it looks like the teeth are everywhere. Um, and there is no lamina dura or sclerotic margin around their roots. Nephrocalcinosis can also be seen, that is deposition of calcium salts in the renal paren parenchyma or gastric mucosal mineralization, and this is all part of the renal failure complex. All right, so the next condition is rickets. Um, rickets is caused by an inadequate plasma level of vitamin D, along with a diet deficient in calcium and phosphorus, so these often go together. And vitamin D is needed for the zone of provisional calcification. So if we zoom in on the physis in the immature animal, as the chondrocytes are lined up, they get ready to be mineralized. And if vitamin D is not present, they cannot mineralize. So this results in a generalized defective bone formation and decreased bone mineralization, resulting in poor growth, weakness, decreased activity, and bone distortion. So causes are dietary, which is less common these days in small animals, or more commonly due to an enzyme deficiency so that vitamin D can't be converted to its active form, or due to a receptor um, malfunction, so that vitamin D3 cannot bind to its reception, uh, receptor in order to function. Sunlight generally isn't or isn't needed by dogs and cats, but some other species may need that. So in the um, image over here, you will see that the physes are abnormally widened and the metaphyses flare outwards. And we'll see that in the next slide as well. So here's marked widening of the physes. Physes should be a relatively thin radiolucent line. The metaphysis is flared outwards and it forms a beaked margin. And then there's a generalized osteopenia, so decreased opacity of the bone. And there's also spinal curvature that can occur. With rickets, um, there can be sort of bowing and um, swelling at the bone. And this old radiograph, um, there's sort of this oval shaped increased um, width of the distal ulnar physis. And interestingly, in this dog, it also looks like there's a retained endochondral cartilage um, core with sclerosis adjacent to it. So this is a nice image just contrasting the two. All right, so panosteitis um, is a condition that's very important to differentiate for in um, young animals presenting for painful limbs. And this is because other common conditions such as hip dysplasia and elbow dysplasia often also occur in the same group of young animals and these need to be differentiated from each other. Panosteitis is quite common, especially in the German Shepherd dog. So again, a dog that's um, quite commonly affected by elbow dysplasia and hip dysplasia. So important to differentiate. The range of ages uh, affected is usually nine months to about two years of age, although some texts have described it occurring up to seven years of age. Males are commonly more affected. Long bones um, clinically are painful on deep palpation, and the humerus is the most common site that's affected followed by the ulna, the radius, and then the hind limb or the pelvic limb. It spreads from bone to bone for up to six months, which actually just means that it results in a shifting lameness. So first one limb may be affected and the patient is lame, that will resolve, and then the next limb might be affected. It's self-limiting, which is a, a result in a good prognosis. And what, now we'll look at the radiological signs. So on this slide, the earliest sign of panosteitis is smudging of the trabecula in the bone, so they become less clear. And at the nutrient foramina, there is a patchy increase in opacity, which appears to be like a fingerprint. In the middle stage, these medullary opacities start to coalesce, so they involve a greater area of the bone. And the endosteum might become irregular instead of being a crisp, smooth line, and the trabeculation might be coarse. In some cases, there might also be a mild, solid periosteal reaction, 
And remember that a solid periosteal reaction indicates a benign condition, which panosteitis is. In the late stage, the medullary opacities resolve and the medulla looks sort of empty or hollow. And this can appear this way for many years. The endosteum, for example, here can remain thickened. The trabeculation in this area, for example, and also over here, um, may remain coarse and the periosteal reaction may regress over time. Here's just two more examples. And it's quite subtle. So this is a dog that presented for hip dysplasia radiographs, and we'll cover that a bit later, but the hips look quite good. But we see here is a thumbprint-like opacity within the right femur, and this is typical of panosteitis. Similar finding here in the distal humerus. Sometimes it's very um, subtle, so one really has to look for it, but there it is. So the treatment is that it's usually, it's a self-limiting um, condition, but sometimes analgesics are needed. Uh, NSAIDs are usually enough. And I know the notes say preds only as a last resort, but um, I don't know how commonly one has to resort to that. Right, the next uh, condition we'll be looking at is hypertrophic osteodystrophy. And this is one of the difficult to remember names. Um, so I like to refer to it just as HOD, but many texts will refer to it as metaphysial osteopathy. This is a condition that occurs in young dogs, three to eight months old, so it's quite a narrow range, and it's rapidly growing large breeds. And there are two breeds that are overrepresented, and this is the Weimaraner and the Great Dane. The metaphysis of the long bones, especially the distal radius and ulna, are most commonly affected. This is a painful condition with swelling over the metaphyses of the long bones. These patients are um, systemically ill, unlike the other conditions we've discussed. So these patients might be depressed, have variable pyrexia, they can have diarrhea, be anemic, or have pneumonia. Um, and the etiology for this condition is uncertain. Distemper has been found in the physis or in the affected lesions in this um, disease, or uh, a vitamin C deficiency has also been suspected, but nothing's been proven. So in the early stage of hypertrophic osteodystrophy, there's an irregular radiolucent line in the metaphyses of the long bones running parallel to the physis. So it's often called the double physis sign. So if we look at the image here, there's the distal radial physis, but then there's another parallel um, radiolucent line to it. Same thing um, with the ulna, we, there's the physis and it's quite regular, whereas the lesion of HOD is this little bit jagged line parallel to it. An important differential would be hematogenous osteomyelitis, but in HOD the radiolucent line is much better defined and is um, sort of linear rather than patchy areas of lysis. Here's just a close-up. Here's the radial physis over here, radiolucent area, and then um, some of it is over there. And then just proximal to it, there's an extra radiolucent line. So it's a double physis. Same thing with the ulna. There's the distal ulnar physis in its cone shape. And then parallel to it is um, this jagged extra radiolucent line. One to two weeks later, um, there can be metaphysial paracortical cuffing. So these linear mineralized areas parallel to the cortices separated by a radiolucent line. Again, if you look at the physis here, there's an extra radiolucent line. After about three to four weeks, this collar of new bone will fuse with the cortex, and this results in a very opaque metaphysial region, just because of all the bones superimposed. This will remodel over time, and often the findings are bilaterally symmetrical. Hypertrophic osteodystrophy can affect the skull. Um, Sometimes it's called large dog craniomandibular osteopathy, but we'll get to CMO a bit later. The physis remain normal, though. So these are just examples of um, later uh, HOD with all of this um, pericortical cuffing that has nearly fused to the cortex, resulting in this marked sclerotic area. Again, over here, it's marked sclerosis. 
This area has got a combination of late HOD because some of the periosteal reaction here is fused, um, as well as sort of the middle stage, where here is a pericortical um, cuff which is still separate from the underlying cortex. So the treatments for hyper hypertrophic osteodystrophy are symptomatic. Um, often they need IV fluids and pain control. Anti-inflammatories might help. Avoid dietary excess and provide nutritional support. And these puppies can be very sick, um, so it might take a while for them to get better. Here I've just included a very nice summary of HOD by uh, DVM360's website. And you guys can um, hit the pause button here and uh, have a read through it. It's uh, quite nicely illustrated. Here's just an example of how hematogenous osteomyelitis can be confused with HOD. If you look at the distal metaphyses in the radius and ulna, there's this irregular radiolucent region, which is consistent with lysis. Um, but if you go back to the previous slides, this is nothing at all like HOD, which is a parallel thinner line, which is much more organized. Um, here's just another example of the distal femurs. Um, the metaphyses are also show this patchy lysis, which um, really look, looks nothing like HOD. Here's another example of hematogenous osteomyelitis to differentiate this paracortical cuffing that we can see. Here it is a thick brush-like reaction that's much more extensive. It um, doesn't start to be uh, by being separated from the underlying cortex. And the most important way to differentiate here is to look at the physis and to realize that there is no parallel radiolucent line. So the physis and the metaph metaphysis in this patient are normal. Right, hypertrophic osteopathy um, sounds a little bit like the previous condition, but it's not. Um, I just call this HOP or HOP. And um, this is also known as Mari's disease. This is bony changes that occur on the limbs secondary to a space occupying lesion in the thorax or occasionally in the abdomen. And in South Africa, the most important cause would be Spirocerca lupi. So I've um, shown an example of an affected thorax. I know this isn't a thoracic lecture, but just to point out. Um, a few things. So in the image on the left um, is the affected dog and the image on the right is a normal dog. So here is this increased soft tissue opacity structure in the caudodorsal mediastinum. This is consistent with the spiral circa um, loopy nodule. Additionally, this patient has got signs of spondylitis, so loss of the concavity of the ventral vertebral body, which is very typical. And um, the other thing that we can see here is the esophagus cranial to the lesion is gas distended. So there's its dorsal wall. This is gas within the esophagus. And what we see here is also the tra uh, tracheal or tracheoesophageal stripe sign. This is the soft tissue band that we can see here, not seen in the normal image. And this is because the soft tissue band uh, represents the summation of the dorsal tracheal wall and the ventral esophageal wall due to gas within each. So gas here within the trachea and gas within the esophagus. So that's just a bit of um, thoracic radiology applicable to hypertrophic osteopathy. So hypertrophic uh, osteopathy starts as um, soft tissue swelling of the limbs. It starts distally on the appendicular skeleton and with time it moves proximally. It can even go as high as the scapula and the pelvis. It's usually bilaterally symmetrical and can involve all four limbs. And there's a brush-like periosteal reaction, which varies from thin to thick to even more solid, surrounding um, the metacarpal bones in this case, also extending up to involve um, the distal ulna and some of the radius. Here's just another example of this, um, extending down the fibula. Um, affecting the calcaneus and then affecting the metatarsal bones. So uh, Mari's disease is, I've said, uh, bilaterally symmetrical. It can be very extensive. It doesn't affect the joints, so it skips them. If the mass is removed, the limb changes can resolve. And this just depends on what type of a mass it is. A malignant tumor 
um, if you go and remove it, there may, might already be metastases. So Mari's disease is um, probably not the most important issue that the dog has. Right, then on to our last condition. This is craniomandibular osteopathy, um, or CMO, also known as lion jaw. This condition has a genetic predisposition in Scotties and Westies. It can occur bilaterally, but not always symmetrically, um, affecting the mandibles, but it can extend caudally to affect the temporomandibular joints, the tympanic bulla, and even the petrous temporal bone. It's self-limiting once the dog has reached um, skeletal maturity, and it can regress as the bone remodels. So this skull example just shows all this new bone present on the mandible of this dog. Clinical signs include mandibular swelling, salivation, difficulty in eating and opening the mouth, especially if the bone involvement is more caudally around the TMJs, and there might be pyrexia also present. So on radiology, we see bony proliferation along the mandible. For example, this image at the top, compared to the normal dog at the bottom. There can be new bone around the tympanic bulla, and this is why this area is so incredibly sclerotic because of all the new bone, versus the tympanic bulla and this dog, which are normal. It can affect the petrous temporal bone, which sits intracranially, also sort of in this area, and then occasionally the long bones can be affected by the periosteal reaction. Um, and this is questionably referred to as small dog HOD. Here's just another example of how extensive it can be. The entire mandible is affected here by a thick brush-like periosteal reaction extending to involve the tympanic bulla. And on the DV, um, on the right of the image or the left side of the dog, there's the normal TMJ. And this TMJ here is hardly visible, probably due to the tympanic bulla near bone, but also possibly um, due to TMJ involvement. And this is also all just new bone extending. Um, laterally. And this patient is probably going to have a very hard time opening his mouth and eating. So treatment, it is a self-limiting condition if it doesn't get too bad. Um, symptomatic treatment might be anti-inflammatories, ensuring that the patient can eat. And if there is TMJ ankylosis, surgery can be considered. In this patient here, um, the radiograph just depicts all the new bone changes seen in the skull over here, and this patient, again, is severely affected and will have issues opening his mouth. Right, and on the, my light, last slide here is just a, a CT image showing how severe it can get. This is a transverse image through the level of the tympanic bulla. So these black areas are the tympanic bulla on either side. Um, this is all this extensive new bone formation that has completely um, narrowed this caudal nasopharyngeal area. and um, has occurred around the tympanic bulla, massively thickening them and extending outwards from there. So this condition can be very severe, making treatment very difficult um, and carrying a guard, guarded prognosis in these cases. All right, so that is the end of the lecture on the idiopathic and metabolic conditions.